Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings 2022. The research of golf is putting sticky. Does it matter in terms of projection and an overall golf chat? Because sometimes I just want to chat about golf, and I know that some people out there want to hear about golf themselves. So this is what we're doing today. Reminder to smash the like button for the video, sub to Mayo Media Network, sub to the audio podcast, rate and review. And of course, if you want to get the best lineup generator, stats, simulator, ownership projections on the market, fantasynational.com slash mayo will get you 25% off all of that. Welcoming in now a first time on the show, which is kind of insane to think about. We pulled some strings. We made it happen. Brandon, yeah, Brandon Gadula from... Number Fire, the managing editor in chief, the Heat Check podcast, co host, my main man, Jim Saunas. If you're ever looking for a podcast that covers exactly the same topics as the Pat Mayo experience, but is more accurate, more analytical, and probably just better in general, Brendan's your man. What's up? Hey, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that me and Jim, you know, coming from Number Fire, we're always looking uh, to let the data do the talking. That doesn't always stick. Um, we can get a little bit off the rails sometimes, but yeah, I mean, you, you can find a lot of golf an, uh, analysis out there that is a little bit more uh, gut and the eye test uh, related, but uh, for us, we're, we're looking more uh, at the data. Um, and, and so for me, it's, it's looking more at like, you know, expected regression. And that's something that uh, I looked into. And that's actually why you asked me uh, to be on the show. You released an article uh, a few weeks ago now about putting. And the one thing that we've kind of talked about in terms of putting historically when we're trying to project out golfers, trying to bet on golfers, trying to make DFS picks for golfers is putting doesn't matter because putting can flip on a dime just like that. The worst putter in the field can become the best putter in the field over an 18-hole, 72-hole stretch. And the example that I always use is that Wes Bryan is never going to outdrive Bryson DeChambeau. It's just never going to happen. So it always made sense that if we're going to try to project out anything sticky, that it would be driving. It would be a approach i mean approach is a bit more fickle but the good approach players tend to be consistent with their approaches especially from whatever distances that you're going to see the plurality of throughout the course of the week so whenever i do my research show on sundays i'm using fantasynational.com i want to see where the buckets are in terms of where the plurality or even the majority of approach shots are coming from and that's going to waver from player to player as well where you know bryson's going to be hitting his approaches much differently than Player X is going to hit their approaches because he drives the ball so much longer. So there's an inherent flaw with a lot of the stats that we look at, but it's the best we have to go on. And I think when it comes to putting is if we can harness putting and try to figure out if we can project that out, if it is, there's something that we can find that is sticky. I just think that's a huge advantage that we could have both in betting, both in DFS, whatever it might be. Is it the case that we can actually take away something from putting numbers? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we all know that, like you said, putting volatile, we can see bad putters have good weeks. We can see good putters uh, have bad weeks. But like you said, the driving a lot stickier. Um, I'm going to be throwing out some R squared numbers, which uh, for our purposes, just basically uh, is how predictive or how much of one thing uh, is explained by by another thing. And um, I looked uh, back at some different uh, sample sizes um, because I'm going to be throwing out some numbers for putting, obviously. That's the, the main focus here. But we need a little bit of context uh, for that. And because of what you said, I'll actually jump uh, to something that I find really interesting. It's not actually in the article. But um, you can look at – to to find sample sizes with golf, it's really difficult. Because do you want to look at month to month, season to season, six months to six months, whatever it is. It's really hard to find, you know, to nail something down. But what you can do is at least try – um, and if you take uh, some six, six month segments and look at golfers with a decent sample, like 25 shot length rounds and, and one sample of, you know, six months to the next, and you can actually compare sort of apples to apples, uh, what they're doing from one sample. We know what they did. Can we project out what they did in the next sample? And if you look at that, we see an R squared value of 0.26 for total strokes gained, which means that about a quarter of a golfer's total strokes gain from say June to November is explained by his strokes gain from the lead in, you know, December um, to July. 
uh, if I have those numbers right, or the months of whatever it is, the six months before, we know about 25% of that. Now, what does that mean without context? Not a whole lot, but what does it mean with some context? So here are some numbers. Uh, for approach, that number is 29%, which actually means then that we can learn more, uh, that, 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 that approach play is stickier from segment to segment than total strokes gained, which is very key for what we do. So why we, we have approach numbers uh, at the top of our list each and every week, but it's actually 39% for strokes gained off the tee, 13% for around the green, and just 18% for putting. So off the tee play, speaking to that, as you mentioned, uh, it's it's twice as, light, uh, twice as predictive as putting, which makes sense. Long hitters stay long. That's the kind of the simplest way to put it. Best, you know, the good drivers can stay good drivers. The irony here being that we're looking at like 30 putts around, give or take. Um, and if we're looking at like a par 72 or par 70, whatever it is, it's, that's like more than 40% of a golfer shots, but what we, we can actually learn more. Uh, we can find things stickier from about 14 full tee shots uh, in that same sample as we can for double those putts. So that's, that's a, you know, just a, a way to put some mathematical basis behind what you're saying. It's absolutely true because you know, sometimes you need to test what you think, you know, um, and in this case, it's absolutely true, but in fact, ball striking. Uh, so if you combine off the tee and approach, that's 43%. Uh, you can learn from one segment to the next for short game. If you combine around the green and putting 18%. So that's why, you know, you, me, all the data centric analysts that we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at the ball striking because it sticks around. And one thing, and I'm, I, I just want to point out, uh, you said putting doesn't matter or something to that effect. And while I'm, you know, largely on that, in that camp, uh, putting does matter around the green plate does matter because if you actually look at the field leaders in a given week and strokes gained off the tee, uh, approach around the green putting, the field leaders in a, in a given week, usually around five and a half to six strokes off the tee. And that's actually the same bucket, about five and a half to six around the green. But again, around the greens, way flukier, less predictive than off the tee. And for approach and putting, it's about eight and a half to nine strokes for the field leader. So we know that approach though is way stickier than putting. So those, the short game matters. It's just too hard to predict. And that's why you know, I wanted to do something about it and look into putting a little bit more. So again, putting does matter a lot, but we just can't predict it as well. And that's uh, basically the, the crux of uh, what I wanted to dig into. Well, I, and I appreciate that you've dug into that. I guess I should reframe the context of that just a little bit of, it's not that yes. putting doesn't matter. Obviously putting does matter. When we look right. at, like, even when I do the research show and I look back at the leaderboard from the year previous, very rarely do you see a Jordan Spieth situation at the Heritage or Justin Thomas from TPC Southwind a few years ago, or even Brooks from that same tournament the year before that, where they lose strokes putting and still win the tournament. You have to have such a good tee to green week for that to happen and just a weird confidence confluence of circumstances. It's just when I am putting together a model and trying to make my picks, I try not to have putting have any influence on it. Cause like you said, it's just very hard to predict, but if we can harness that even a little bit to try to find mm -hmm. a data point, a putting range, whatever it might be that I could include, I certainly would. I just don't know how to do it. Right. And, and, that was not like a, uh, that was honestly more of a dig at how I used to approach things where I said putting didn't matter. I look at just teeter green. Um, and that's the wrong way to look at things. So, you know, we're, we're trying to get into how can we use putting, uh, right? Because we know that putting in a, in a given week matters. If we know who put, who puts well in a given week, we would actually give a lot of weight to that. We just don't know. And that's basically what I'm trying to dig into. So, uh, the, the core of what I did was looked at putting splits and I leveraged uh, fantasy national for this because it, it, you know, fantasy national can break out the putting splits from, you know, zero to five feet, five to 10, et cetera. Um, and so you can learn a lot about uh, golfers putting ability. When you look at strokes gained from within 10 feet, you can explain around 77% of a golfer's long-term strokes gained putting from putts within 10 feet, which make up around 65% of a golfer's chances. A lot of tap-ins, short putts, roughly half of all putts are within five feet. And you can in increase that number in terms of explaining strokes gained putting to about 80% if you add on putting from 10 to 15 feet as well, which totals around 75% of a golfer's chances. If you're looking at all those putts from within 15 feet, leaves about a quarter of the putts, uh, the, what would 
you can just sort of bucket into lag putting from 16 plus feet. So essentially you can er eradicate that lag putting from a player's stats and you'll still know roughly how good a putter he is. Putting is, and this is the, really the only word we can use, volatile. It's super volatile. And again, that's that's what we're talking about when we say putting doesn't matter. Because putting leading in is really, it's really hard to rely on. As I mentioned, only about 18% of putting kind of sticks around anyway. So it ju it's just too volatile to deal with. But if you weed out that long, the, those longer putts, you can actually learn a lot about putting. And I'll spare everyone the details, but just think of a putter. You know, some, one guy has all eight footers. He makes half. He nets out at a, at a zero in terms of strokes gained putting. Another golfer has some eight footers, but a bunch of like 25 footers doesn't make any of the eight footers makes like a few of the bombs. Uh, we know that one of those skill sets is a lot easier to replicate and it's making eight footers more consistently. So you can overlook a lot of the issues of sample size. If you just, you know, use long-term samples, but we're not really trying to use a hundred round samples for everything because when you look at a betting board or DFS salaries, it's not necessarily based on, long-term stuff it's looking at how's a guy finishing if we have a if we see someone with like four top 15s in his past five starts and it's fueled by putting like that's going to shorten his win odds it's going to raise his uh, his dfs salary um and, and historically like that's a bad thing because we know that's not going to stick around so basically the article goes through the process uh some failed things that don't really work round to round variants pointless uh, to look at one round and try to predict the next when it comes to putting um, even month by month stuff, not really enough of a sample size uh, to rely on in terms of overall strokes gained putting. And that's why if you look at the core of putting, it's within 10 feet, within 15 feet. That's about uh, you know three fourths of your putting. If you're good from there, the stats say you're going to be good uh, long term. And if you're uh, you know getting a lot of strokes from those longer putts, you're about to cool down. And if you're not hitting any of those putts, statistically you're about to hit a few so that's basically the core uh, of what i'm looking at here one of the things that i'm looking at right now on fantasy national i created a rolling report for myself and it's you know, putts gained from 10 to 15 feet so it gives you from the past four rounds on a chart all the way up 8 12 24 50 last 100 rounds so i sort it by last 100 rounds sung kang is number one from that range across the board until the last four rounds where he's only number two which is kind of shocking how consistent he is from that overall range but everyone else like so what am i looking at when i see someone like sam Ryder, who is fifth the past 100 rounds seventh past 50 rounds and then i look at past 24 and past 12 and he's like 127 or 93rd how do i try to contextualize that has he lost it at that point and he's now regressed back into the putter maybe he always has if we look back at the past like 500 rounds and he just went through a 50 round hot streak essentially on the greens like is that telling me anything like that's what I'm trying to figure out like what how can I use that data to my advantage so you said you pulled up 10 to 15 uh foot putts yes okay if you do five to ten that's basically the money round uh, okay. the, the, the money range. If you, I mean, I use zero to 15. So I basically sum up the zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15. You can throw that in, into Excel, run a little bit, but run a quick formula there. And you can learn expected strokes gain putting. But for me, for Sam Ryder, I have the 2022 stats up. Um, I just did that uh, from fantasy national. So Sam Ryder gaining about seven, uh, seven and a half strokes putting from 10 to 15 feet, losing 1.9 from five to 10, which again is, is a crucial range gaining about one and a half from within five feet. So what this is actually saying is uh, from the area where he's going to hit about 60% of his putts, he's a neutral or slightly negative putter. Again, one, one and a half positive plus the, the one and a half or 1.9 negative. He's actually netting out from within 10 feet um, as a, as a, as a minus putter. So for me, this says like Sam Ryder again, and I do use the 10 to 15 uh, feet range, but that is only about, you know, 10% of a golfer's putts. So what you want to do um, in terms of th the simplest way to implement this, if this is kind of what we're getting at is the simplest way is to look at putting from five to 10 feet. If you sort the past hundred round leaders by five to 10 feet, you're probably going to like what you see in terms of the putters say, yeah, this makes sense. You're probably going to see Cam Smith, Patrick yep. Reed, Brandon Todd, <laughs> maybe Denny McCarthy up there. So that's what you want to see. And again, this is a small sample of putts. Um, it's only about 15% of putts. It's in the article somewhere. 
um, in terms of the frequency of putts from that range. But yeah, so about 15% of putts, but it explains that alone, that segment alone explains 60% of a golfer's long-term putting. So if, if anyone's listening and they're like, I'm not going to put this in a spreadsheet. I, don't, I just want this as simple as possible. Just use putting from uh, five to 10 feet and you're going to weed out a lot of the noise, a lot of the variance um, in putting and you, you'll be pretty, you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll be pretty good from there. So what are we looking at in terms of the sample? Would you say the past 100 rounds is likely the thing to look at? So that depends. So for me, if you're looking, if you're willing to go as deep as a hundred rounds, a lot of this stuff is going to smooth out. The real reason I wanted to dig into some of this stuff is because, as I said before, the betting market is not necessarily factoring in such a large sample. Now, of course, it, it's not the past four, eight rounds, and that's how they sort the, the odds board. But it's more if you're looking at someone who's uh, performing really well over the past 24 rounds or 12 rounds with putting and it's all coming from long range putts and not necessarily from within five to 10 feet, uh, then you're going to see that's someone who you probably want to avoid. So I'll try to pull this up too. Um, so I have that, that same leaderboard up, but basically, um, you're trying to avoid the hot putters who are doing it in an unsustainable way. So the golfers who are gaining a lot of strokes from outside 15 feet, um, and maybe targeting the golfers who are really hot from five to 10, which again is generally those best putters. They pass the eye test, uh, but who are not having any luck on those long range putts, which are probably going to eventually fall. If we're talking about the best long-term putters from that, that money range, that consistent range, that range where golfers actually have some control over whether they're going to make the putts or not. Because again, inside five feet, it's about 97% of a make frequency um, from five to 10, it's about 55%. And then from 10 to 15 falls the whole way down to 31%. So if you're looking at that range of like makeable realistic putts, and you're looking only at that, you're going to weed out a ton of that variance um, on the longer end. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. I sorted by past 24 rounds in terms of five to 10 feet in terms of strokes game putting. And it does give you the guys that you would think like Tyrrell Hatton is one of the best putters on earth amongst any range. He's number one in that category over the past 24 rounds, but he's sixth in the past 50, 15th over the past hundred. That would lead me to believe that's a little bit stickier, at least from that range is that he has no real huge fluctuations going through anything where he's just very consistent from that one range. Maybe it is his long range putting, or maybe he's missed a few three foot putts and that's completely skewing off his zero to five. And that's really impacting his strokes game putting. Cause I would, I would, it would lead me to believe that if you miss a three footer, that's going to be, I mean, I know, I know what the case is, but if you miss a three foot putt, like that is hugely detrimental to your strokes game putting overall when the total number, the summation comes out at the end. Yeah. Um, and so that's why that, that, uh, you know, you're, you, you want to try to make this as, as simple as possible, right? Um, you want to be realistic here and you want to say, okay, Jordan Spieth is someone who always pops up as like the best putter. And when I actually looked into this stuff uh, a few years ago, I was like, okay, I know Jordan Spieth's the best putter on the planet. I looked at his splits on fantasy national. I was like, well, he's actually kind of bad from like zero to five and five to 10 feet. So I was like, I guess that doesn't really matter as much. And it's all about hitting those long range putts. That's actually not the case. Like it's the opposite. And Jordan Spieth, and for anyone who maybe doesn't love Jordan Spieth, probably has been screaming this from the rooftops for a while now. It's unsustainable what Jordan Spieth did. But is, is it for so long? Is it unsustainable, or do we just have to live in a world where there are just huge outliers, and maybe he's an outlier? Mackenzie Hughes would be another one that I feel like would just be an outlier in this. So there are going to be outliers, and lag putting absolutely is a skill to some degree. But hitting thirty-five footers consistently—that's not really a skill that we can bank on. Um, Mackenzie Hughes, though. He's an interesting name because he actually is really good uh, from that that zero to five, that five to ten foot range, or at least good enough. He's a positive, and that's something else we can get into in terms of. It's one thing to be an outlier in the good sense, an outlier in the bad sense, uh, but you regress back to sort of what your expectation, your specific baseline is. It doesn't say, you know, if you're a if you're overperforming with putting, you're about to be a horrible putter. That's not the case. So there are outliers, absolutely. But the difference here is when we see Jordan Spieth struggle from within 
10 feet, that from the data is, is basically saying this is expected because you have some control over whether you're making your, your putts from within 10 feet. If you look back at Jordan Spieth uh, year to year and I actually did pull up uh, some Spieth numbers here. Um, he, if you, you just don't see him ever gaining strokes from within five feet. And again, that's a lot of your putts. That's about half your putts. And from within five to 10 feet, not necessarily uh, a, a range where he's good. His best putting year, statistically, 2019, he was really good from five to 10 and from 10 to 15. That's kind of an outlier for him. Uh, the the, the long range putting kind of sticks around, but then we're still looking at only about a quarter of his putts, right? If we're looking only at the long range putting, uh, that's a quarter of his putts. If he doesn't get any of those to fall, and then he's relying on the quarter putter from within 10, 15 feet, that is why Jordan Spieth can struggle. On the flip side, we have Cam Smith, who's the complete opposite. He's nails from within 10 feet. And when you see him stand over an eight footer, you think he's going to make it. When you see Jordan Spieth stand over like a 35 footer, you think he might make it. But when you see Jordan Spieth over an eight footer, you don't really think he's going to make it. So this is where we can kind of use that eye test. But you watch Cam Smith at the players or the masters. Every time he has a makeable putt, I think he's going to make it. When Jordan Spieth has that, or some of these guys who do struggle from within 10 feet, you don't really feel the same thing. And so we kind of know that that's the case. And there's data backing this up now because it's not going to surprise us if Cam Smith does hit some long range putts, but it might actually kind of surprise us if, if Jordan Spieth is just tapping in uh, from five feet consistently, because it doesn't really happen for him. It's funny looking back at Spieth's past, like rolling report of the hundred rounds to now over the past 47 rounds in terms of that putting from five to 10 feet, he's actually 47th. He is outside the top 130 and well into the two hundreds in essentially almost every other sample size when it comes down to it so it seemed like he had like a really good run for like three weeks which boosted up at like about 92 rounds ago that is boosting anything up for him in the long term it's still not even like he's popping off the charts and to kind of combine what you said with cam smith like the guys from the past 50 rounds that rate out the best in this are the guys that you would traditionally think of as the best putters brian gay cameron smith Bo hostler tyrell hatton mackenzie hughes david hearn bubba is one and Patrick, I mean, Patrick Reed, we would probably expect, but Bubba is shockingly good from this range. Yeah, you'll you'll learn a lot about uh, certain golfers in terms of what you think expectation is. Bubba, I think it's that like great lag putter kind of uh, connotation uh, attached to him. But like sometimes you see golfers who are actually pretty good from within a certain range like cam champ actually was pretty decent entering the masters from like this money range yeah he is so i was pretty in (laughs) i was pretty and so like that's the thing like you don't think of cam champ as being a great putter but if you look at his long range putting he's probably just not making a whole lot of long range putts um and this is kind of like how we can use this maybe to buy low on certain golfers two names that jump out just because we're kind of throwing out some names here we think of uh, really good golfers, uh, Brendan Todd, Brian Gay. They're basically leading the PGA Tour in strokes game putting in 2022. But Brendan Todd is gaining 26 strokes uh, of his 30, basically, from within 15 feet. He's losing four from 15 plus, whereas Brian Gay is gaining about 19. Uh, or I should use Danny McCarthy is a better example. He's gaining 16 from within 15 feet, but 14 uh, from from over 15 feet. So he's he's making a lot of bombs. Um, he's gaining seven strokes from that 25 plus range. Brendan Todd, though, really, really good, uh, way better than Denny McCarthy from within that 15 foot range, but has just struggled from 25 or from 15 plus uh, feet. And you then you ask yourself, is this because Brandon Todd cannot make a long putt because he's a terrible lag putter? That's probably going to be a no for most of these uh, you know good putters. It's He's having bad luck, whereas Denny McCarthy, still a good baseline putter because he's gaining strokes from within 15 feet. However, he's gaining way too many from long range for this really to be sustainable. So again, when you want to talk about regression, what this would say is Brendan Todd's about to get a little bit more luck on the long range while still being a really good short range putter. Denny McCarthy should cool down a bit, but that's not to say he's about to be a bad putter because the baseline his performance from that five to 10 range, zero to 15, whatever, whatever range you want to use still really good. And that's something that I think can get lost with regression uh, is 
just because you're overperforming does not mean you're about to be bad. It just means that you're about to go more back towards your baseline. How do we utilize this data in practical use of whether it's betting or DFS? Yes, we can identify regression by trying to figure out long range putting versus 15 feet and in. But how do we mirror that with the picks that we actually want to make? Like, yeah, Brendan Todd might be really good from inside 15 feet. Danny McCarthy might be really good from inside 15 feet. But if they never hit the ball to inside 15 feet, then it's a real problem because they're just not like I, the opportunities gain stat on fantasy now which is 15 feet and in. So would you would it make a lot of sense to just even build a chart of here are opportunities gained per round, here is a chart of you know 10 to 15 feet putting per round and try to mirror those together and try to find who are the players that match up near the top of both lists? So putting still is only a, it's a piece to the puzzle, right? And that's something that is always going to be the case putting i would say for me weights in at most about 20 percent of what i'm looking for it's just that i can now use what i think is a more reliable source of putting this just you know within 15 feet or just five to ten if you want to go that route so it's less a matter of using this to say okay uh let's play brandon todd because he's really good from within 15 feet same kind of example I can use whenever we come to a course where accuracy matters more than usual. You're not sorting the list of players by fairways hit and saying these are the guys this week. You're also not sorting this by the best putters from 5 to 10 feet or from within 15 feet because there's more to it than that, right? So we're looking still at Tita Green, ball striking number one. It's just more that how I implement this is I just eradicate uh, that lag putting, the, that that those longer putts from what I'm doing. So instead of looking, uh, instead of adding strokes gain putting into a mixed condition model, for example, I'm adding in five to ten feet, or you know zero to five and five to ten feet, weighting them a little bit differently. So that's the I think how we can implement this most is it's not to say, you know, rank everyone based on their putting. It's instead of using overall putting, uh, use this smaller uh, the the closer putts. And that should get you more to where you're going. You won't be chasing uh, the the golfers who are overperforming. And if you want to, you know, expand this out if someone's really interested in it, if you keep track of this, you can just, you know, pull this into an Excel spreadsheet each week from Fantasy National. Um, you can see who's actually overperforming, underperforming based on that formula I'm using. So I'm trying to see who's maybe overperforming, underperforming, and whose odds are a little bit too long or too short. And if everything else matches up, then I'll go there. But again. This isn't this isn't the answer. It's a piece to the puzzle, um, and it's a way to eradicate some of that volatility when it comes to the putting. Is it? I'm trying to think about how I want to construct this and try to implement this into the numbers that I try to build out every week and try to make my own rankings and try to find the best values on golfers. Would it make sense to never implement f- zero to five feet into anything because? If guys are missing from that range, Spieth at the Heritage kind of excluded because that was such an outlier where he missed like four of them inside five feet, maybe even more, that generally speaking, if your guy is going to win a tournament, they're just going to have to make 100% of those putts? So you can you can make that case, um, but the reality is, and this is like a, an unsexy kind of thought here, but like that's those are half your putts, right? If you can't make those, you're going to struggle. And yes, you need to make, to make those, but <clears throat> we can understand about 45, 46% of a golfer's putting ability from that range alone, which again, isn't as fun as saying, Hey, we learn a lot based on the guys who make these bombs. That's not how it works. We actually learn a lot more from who's making those consistent putts. So I would advocate against eradicate. Uh, you, I, I keep saying eradicating for some reason, but, um, <laughs> Not using the the zero to five is not the way that I would go. I would say not using the the long the longer putt. So um, to go back to your example of opportunities gained plus maybe putting from within 15 feet, I actually ran a mixed condition model um, that was just tee to green, weighted very heavily, and then putting from within zero to five, putting from five to ten, sorted, and it looks really good. Um, I did it for just the, the PGA Tour sample because I was curious to see you know who those guys would be. Uh, but Patrick Cantlay, Shane Lowry, Tyrrell Hatton, Cam Smith, Victor Hovland, Sungjae, Xander, 
Seamus Power, Max Homa. Like these are some pretty big names, right? And that's because we're still using T to green much more than we are putting because I would presume you don't use putt. As you said, we don't really rely on putting much in terms of the pre-tournament predictions. But if we use the zero to five, the five to 10, that those kinds of ranges, we're actually going to maybe make this a little bit more powerful um, in the long term. It's funny to look at Luke List, who is third worst of all PGA players from the 5 to 10 range. But looking at his farmer's victory and trying to reverse engineer what actually happened there, uh, from 0 to 5 feet in the final two rounds, he actually lost a stroke and a half to the field from that range. But he was positive in both rounds from 5 to 15 feet, both of those categories. Gained a stroke and a half, gained a stroke, gained 1.1 strokes, gained 0.3 strokes. And that's all he really needed to do because the tee to green was so good in compilation with that. Looking at basically his performance since the Farmers, he has gained one, two, three, four times between five to 10 and 10 to 15 in just a given round out of what appears to be 36 rounds. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I this won't be as evergreen as I, as I would like it to be, but I did throw in a list of the best and worst expected putters in the article that's up on number fire. And yeah, Luke list really stands out as someone who's a look, you don't want any putting analysis to say Luke list is a good putter. His expected putting <laughs> is really bad and it's because he's bad. And the, I think that maybe the simplest way to think of this um, more than anything, because I know sometimes, you know, regression and all this stuff can get a little bit, um, too convoluted, especially whenever you're trying to go through and make your own picks in, in a given week. There's, it's just, again, it's a small piece of the puzzle, but think of it this way. Um, golfers hit about 75% of their putts from within 15 feet. If you're losing strokes consistently from within 15 feet, you're probably not a good putter. If you're gaining strokes consistently from within 15 feet, you're probably a good putter. And so if you just weed out that stuff at the end, the stuff that you can't control as much, the stuff with a make percentage of five or ten percent, you you as someone betting or building daily fantasy lineups, you're going to do yourself a pretty good service um, to 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 look at things that way. But yes, Luke List, big head scratcher. But again, it's putting can come and go, and if it's good enough, it can get you there. If the tee to green's good, so someone like Luke List, I always struggle with. Historically, I would say I only want to look at the tee to green stuff. That's why I've lost so much money on Luke List over the years. Now it's a little bit more of uh, an understanding of what goes into putting um, rather than just crossing it off the list entirely. How do we figure out if guys have legitimately improved? Because there was a, probably a five to six year stretch where Webb Simpson was the absolute shits. He was the worst putter on tour. And then all of a sudden he gets a new, he starts going back to the long putter. He gets a new putting coach. All of a sudden he's absolute nails on the green. Adam Scott is another one. This was a guy who'd bring three putters to a practice round and couldn't figure out, couldn't drain anything with any of them. And then all of a sudden you look up, he has a year and a half stretch where now he's a top 20 putter in terms of strokes game putting. How do you figure out when guys have actually made a leap and changed what they're doing? Because we thought that was going to be the case for Aaron Wise. Aaron Wise, towards the end of 2021, having this horrific season in terms of putting like he always does and then you get to the swing season and actually really the FedEx Cup playoffs he switches to the broom putter and all of a sudden he starts gaining strokes putting and it's not just one tournament or two tournaments it's like five in a row six in a row and then all of a sudden we get to 2022 and the guy can't putt again so I don't know when should we actually believe into it and does that just come in with sometimes you have to make an educated guess and kind of go with that yeah so what you're basically citing for a lot of these is actual changes and to to quote uh, my co-host on the heat check jim sonis jim loves himself what he calls the most relevant sample and if there's a change if there's an actual change to a putter putting coach some sort of tangible thing we can look at and say look things are different then you have to adjust the hard part is tracking that across the 200 or however many players we'll see across various tournaments on the PGA tour. And that's why, yes, the eye test can really go a long way, but we can't monitor everyone in terms of, you know, who's changing equipment, that kind of stuff. But in that case, yeah, look at the smaller sample, look at things since they've changed. One thing I'm kind of waiting for the sample to build up where we don't have greens books, this kind of see who's putting well uh, in this, you know, in 2022, the samples are still a little bit too small for that, but it's funny you say that because one name that, that really jumps up uh, for me 
and is a perfect example of how I'm how this actually changes the way that I'm looking at things is John Rom. We've seen John Rom change his putter in 2022. I think from the Rossi to something else, then back to the Rossi, something like that. Uh, but he's really not. He, he he's working on something. He's trying to figure something out. But John Rom, long term, great baseline putter. I don't think people maybe realize how good John Rom is long term with the putter. However. Right now, he is really bad from five to ten feet. One hundred, like one hundred and seventy fourth over the past fifty rounds from five to ten feet. From ten to fifteen, he's still twenty seventh. <laughs> yeah. So from that five to ten feet range, which is again the most predictive single range that we could really point to, um, he's struggling. Now, historically, I would say, well, I know John Rom's a great long term putter, so this is just a cold snap. He's gonna he's gonna get back to it. Now that I'm looking more at where he's missing from that's a bad range to be missing from so i'm less likely just to sit back and say i want to buy low on john rom and it's more i want to track that five to ten feet range to see when he's kind of figuring things out again because that is that's important you're still going to be hitting a good number of putts from there you can make those putts and if you're missing those putts i think he's at like 48 percent and the the pga tour average is like 60 percent from there that is it's hard to win a PGA tour event. If you're losing, you know, that number of strokes uh, from that range that is actually makeable. So um, yeah, the relevant samples, when you do see guys change things, be open to the change. Uh, but for me, I would still want to see at least like, you know, 24 rounds of the, that within 10 feet to say that's like, something's a little bit different here. And some guys are figuring things out. How do you, parse guys that are seemingly really good from one range within this sort of like zero to 15 feet and then really bad from the next, but then really good. And the, the guy is Rory who's ninth from zero to five feet, 207th from five to 10 feet and 12th from 10 to 15 feet. Like that doesn't make any sense. So I think a lot of that can just be chalked up to variance in, in a lot of ways where it's, you're looking at smaller samples uh, from these different ranges, five to 10, again, about 15% of your putts, 10 to 15, 9% of your putts on average, if you're like the average player. So it's small samples. I mean, if you go back through a round and you look at the average putts per round for a golfer, it's about 29. So if you give everyone field average putts from, from these ranges, you're looking at about 14 putts from within five feet, 4.2 from five to 10, about under three from that 10 to 15 range. So like you're looking at small samples, but I think in that case, it's most likely variance in a lot of ways, which is why I, I for a long time considered just using that five to 10 foot range, but we're looking at too, too few putts uh, from just five to 10 to tell us enough uh, for me consistently. So that's why that's why I broke it out into the uh, 15 and in for me as my sort of baseline. So for for whenever you see something like that with someone who's really good from zero to five, but maybe not so good five to 10, probably just some variance. Uh, but that's why for me, I don't want to look at just a single range, although I do think you can do it if you want to keep this simple, look at the five to 10. I think that's fine. Uh, but for me, that that's really coming down to variance because. Um, we're still looking at fairly wide ranges, a five foot putt and a 10 foot putt still pretty different uh, in terms of the make probability there. Oh, for sure. I just kind of zoomed yeah. out a little bit with Rory in terms of the past hundred rounds rather than the past 50. And all of a sudden he goes from top 10 from zero to five feet to 143rd remains awful 200th from five to 10, but his 10 to 15 foot putting remains inside the top 10. Like that, that's, I guess the part that I find it hard to figure out. So yeah, inside 10 feet, Hasn't been very good. Has been doing better on its inside five foot putts. So long term, he's just bad from ten feet it in. But these two specific ranges, even zooming out a little bit more, ten to fifteen and twenty to twenty five, he just remains really good at. Uh, is it like? Is it a? And this is the part that we can never quantify. That we're never going to know. That becomes very difficult to figure out when we're trying to project this out. Is there just? Obviously, there is probably something mental with it for him that maybe he gets to a certain range and he puts less pressure on himself in terms of trying to make the putt. He's just trying to basically two putt, leave it to an inch, that kind of thing from 23 feet. Yet he starts making those. But when he's four feet away, dude just slips out the entire time. Yeah, it's very possible. Um, and it, it's look, one of the things that sort of just subjectively I don't love about trying to whittle things down into putting is you want to say, that that putting like confidence doesn't matter it absolutely matters if you've ever held a putter 
you know, confidence matters um, for these guys. If they're making those, you know, long range putts like Jordan Spieth, I wonder if there's a correlation where whenever Jordan Spieth is making those long range putts, if he's actually better from five to 10, I don't know that that's really hard to figure out because we're looking at hundreds of golfers every week, hundreds and thousands of putts, you know, over a, over a sample. So yeah, I think that men- mentally there's a big part of this and, you know, sometimes you hear people knock strokes gain because it doesn't like he was trying to put it to two feet rather than make it. It's like, that's, that's fine. But if you use a long enough sample and you, you said you spaced out um, and, and Rory does start to fall off when, as you grow that sample, that's why a longer sample within about a hundred rounds, not, I'm not talking career. I'm not talking five years looking at, you know, like long, long term history. If you look at a, a, a longer sample, you're going to get a really good idea of who these golfers truly are. If you look at the past 24, 36, 50 rounds, you're still going to see a lot of variance in there. And again, that kind of stuff, the 24, the 36 rounds, that's what's driving a lot of DFS salaries, uh, the finishing positions, driving the, the betting odds. And that's why I want to look back and say, okay, over the past 24 rounds, who is getting way too lucky on these long putts that therefore in theory, you know, getting, uh, getting the ball in the hole in, in fewer strokes, finishing better, having their odds driven down and maybe some guys that I don't want to bet in a given week. And obviously the flip side of that, but, um, for, to figure out who's actually a good putter using long-term samples is helpful. If you're trying to fade, uh, some guys you don't want to be playing, uh, in DFS or make bets on, you can use that the the smaller samples, but look at the more predictive putting. So it's kind of a twofold answer because we're trying to answer two different things in that context. And I think what people fall into the trap of, Bo, and I've been on both sides of this, I think, because I've been writing about golf and doing golf picks for, geez, 13 years now. And I'm not young anymore. But when I first started <laughs> doing it, it would be, hey, like pull up Mike Miller's sheet at Smart Bet, uh, Smart smart golf bets it was such a huge resource like how are these guys finishing positions coming in and essentially just base it all off that and then Mm -hmm. go to pga tour.com and see if the the yearly sample of how these guys are doing in terms of whatever metric kind of jibe and that's when i hooked up with moose probably around i think it was 2015 2016 and the whole genesis behind fantasy national he had built this out and i was like this is all I ever wanted in terms of how I want to do my research. I just want everything in one spot. I don't want to have 24 tabs open at the top of my Chrome page and have to click in between them. And I would like to have something like we see in football on every single fantasy site. You can sort football by ranges. You want to look at the past four games, the past two games, this specific date to this specific date. That was the whole genesis behind the birth of Fantasy National was to be this one-stop shop where you could do any sort of research that you wanted to, but it was so easy to customize that even though everyone had access to the same numbers, that people could just look at it in any way they wanted. They could find their own path in order to do it. No one knowing what was right, no one knowing what was wrong, but I do think that sometimes that and I've gone to this as well, just relied too heavily on the numbers because I used to have a lot of success when I was using basically no stats coming into it. And then I went all stats and sometimes I would have a lot of success. Sometimes I would have no success whatsoever. So I think when we're building out these models and trying to use these numbers to our best advantage, I think that the best people who do it now come to learn that, hey, these numbers are telling us one thing, but we know that there is this unknown variable that is out there. How do you incorporate that into your analysis? I guess that's subjective to each individual person. But I think when people run the numbers and try to solely rely on what those numbers are telling us is that they don't realize that there is this segment of the numbers that is completely unquantifiable. That's why it can never exist. Like when we're having our discussion about this putting, do we know that they've changed putters? Probably not. Most times we don't know that going in that someone needs to tell us, we need to see it in practice before we can actually try to incorporate that into the data. So I think that's a part of golf modeling, which, you know, this isn't baseball. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. And I'm talking, yeah, I mean, (laughs) No, I'm with you 100%. Look, I build out uh, wind simulation models and I look at betting odds and I say, okay, my numbers say that Colin Morikawa, who's always a little bit overvalued uh, in the betting market because he converts wins based on what my data says. If I look only ever at the the wind simulation model I build out, which is just numbers, no subjective uh, analysis at all, 
I will basically never bet Colin Morikawa. I'll never bet a favorite uh, for the most part, unless it's like John Rahm, who just gets a little bit uh, lo- longer than maybe he should be in certain uh, spots. But yeah, it's it's a it's a matter of combining the eye test, what you think, uh, and and I think the data because anyone who doesn't use data is actually using data in different ways and they probably don't realize it with the finishing positions you finish well because you're playing good golf (laughs) good golf it comes from you know good tee to green good putting like you can look just at who you think swinging it well but that's going to actually translate most of the time into stats but yeah i mean you and i we both do a lot of football analysis and um there's a lot of subjectivity in that a lot of variance as well with and with touchdowns but with golf it doesn't have to be all one or the other doesn't have to be just the data or just the eye test. Sometimes, you know, I build out, I mean, every week I I run a simulation for the, the particular field. I see where the value is in theory, at least assuming that the numbers uh, are perfect, which they're probably not, but it's a good jumping off point to see maybe who's way overvalued. And now that I'm actually looking at this more, um, I'm starting to realize that some of these guys who are putting really well tend to be a little bit more overvalued based on my model. Um, And those guys who are really good from within that, that, uh, that sort of money range that I'm referring to, but aren't hitting a lot of putts. Therefore they're not, you know, they're, they're accruing, you know, two or three more strokes around because they're not hitting any, any, any longer putts, their odds are starting to drift. And those are the types of uh, opportunities that I'm trying to attack. So yeah, golf is is super fun uh to to dig into because we do have this data it's not it's not perfect We're, we got a long way to go with golf data yet but there's still some of that eye test that you can rely on because golf's so volatile that if you're just betting you know take a take a major for example pick anyone near the top and you're you're off to a good start like that's just how it works whether that whether the, the the data for him is exactly as good as other someone else at the top not really the case necessarily for the way that we do things, but you're still like, you're still getting a chance to, to hit a winner there. So yeah, I mean, it's a really fascinating combination of, of the eye test uh, with the data. And you also have this complete other subsect where this is an individual sport rather than something like baseball, mm-hmm. where I mean, baseball, you would think that individual sports would be easier for this because you're just dealing with one person sample playing by themselves. One of the main reasons that baseball is not so projectable, but it's the baseline. I mean, the R squared is probably much better for baseball than it is for golf when we're trying to come up with some sort of constant moving forward regression really does seem to happen over the the sample of an entire season in baseball where it just might not I mean it it happens with guys in baseball as well where you see someone like Matt Cain for years whose batting average of balls in play was like 213 and you're like well that's got to come up to like 275 300 and it just didn't for a bunch of years. So then you have to try to come up with ways to explain that. But most guys will regress to their mean positively or negatively. And if they never regress negatively and down from like a 400, they're probably out of the league by that point because they just weren't very good to begin with. So then you just lose them from the sample completely. But when we're thinking about golf, you have this individual who might have been drinking the night before. He might have slept weird. And golf more than any other sport that stuff actually matters more than let's say in football or basketball or anything like that because guys just might punt around there is a motivation factor if a guy shoots eight over on uh, one day he's just like you know screw this I, i'm going on to next week i don't care what i do maybe i'll withdraw maybe i just won't give a crap about this round we have no idea how that's ever going to play itself out when we run the numbers but i think the bigger thing is that i really struggle to contextualize is course to course like it's not i mean yes you have park factors in baseball where that can be parsed out but if you're playing in football you have indoor stadiums which are all basically constant and you might have to adjust for field turf i don't know how to do any of that stuff but i assume that's the case if you're playing in buffalo versus playing in miami that's going to be two different things the weather's going to be different the wind is going to be different it's for it's far more likely to rain in tampa bay and have lightning storms than it's going to be minus four with 45 mile per hour wins there has to be some sort of adjustment to go into that but every week in golf it's a completely different venue and that venue isn't the same year to year round to round because they change it up every single day so how do we even try to start to factor that in that's a very very (laughs) good point very loaded question um for me the the thing that i would point anyone to is 
being open to that larger sample. When I build out my model, I use the past year of data. Uh, I do account for field strength, so everything's adjusted for who's actually in the tournament, but also some recency. So the more recent rounds are weighted more heavily than things you know a full year ago. But if you're looking at if you're looking at the just the numbers and you're looking at like oh this this guy's got three straight top twenties, like everything sets up well for him. That's not a big enough sample. Like the 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 best example I can kind of give is if you sort the best uh, golfers, you know, strokes gain total over the past 12 rounds, it's going to look kind of suspect. Whereas if you do it over the past 100 rounds, it's going to make a lot more sense. So one thing you can do to sort of flatten out the variance, get a little bit more of, uh, or a lot more of a sample, a little bit less variance is to use larger samples, be open to it. Don't chase the hot streaks because one golfer might have sort of a, a poor a night of sleep, as you mentioned, uh, maybe not feeling well, maybe just kind of trying some things. And sometimes we don't know that certain golfers are just working on stuff. <laughs> I think that probably happens. Uh, but you can actually, I, I really think that that one, one thing we can do here um, is use a larger sample that lets some stuff flatten out. We'll not necessarily be as prone to like, maybe someone got a bad wind draw, you know, two, two weeks ago, we're looking at that, that really bogged down all of his stats because he was hit playing in bad win where someone else had that week off. His numbers look way better. If you're just looking at like the, the a super recent sample, you can run into a lot of these issues and you can kind of overcome some of that. If you're just open to trusting the longer term data, it's going to feel a little bit more boring. You're always going to be drawn to like someone like Patrick Cantlay, uh, which is usually is not a bad thing. Uh, so long as he can convert some wins, but um, a larger sample, it makes a lot of sense. That would be another thing, too. We finally saw it break through for Patrick Cantlay when he won Player of the Year in 2021. But the amount of times that Patrick Cantlay has been either leading after 36 holes or within two on Sundays, and maybe it's just starting to become like the Rory effect with Cantlay is that he's in contention so much and doesn't convert that it seems like he's just gagging it away all the time. But like Pebble Beach, the Heritage, like these tournaments that don't have class fields, he just not converting wins in, which is really strange. It is. Um, which is another way. It's a weird thing because Cantley beat Morikawa at Memorial last year and came through in the playoff. But I, I mean, Morikawa is the most profitable, better, most profitable golfer I've ever bet on. Because I really do think that there is something to him that when he's in contention, he just shuts the door. <laughs> I think there are definitely those guys. And as someone who loves Xander Schauffele, this <laughs> this conversation hurts me. Uh, but the long term data on Xander is always really good. Um, and I think that. One thing that's a little bit unfair to Patrick Cantlay in this conversation, and it's not, you know, it's not just you. It's we hear this a lot with a lot of golfers, a lot of different situations. But like, would you rather Patrick Cantlay not be in contention and finish runner up? Yeah. Like, would you rather see him finishing twentieth? Uh, maybe do some Rory like backdoor top tens and say, well, the one time he was actually in contention, he shut the door on someone. Like for me, I don't care so much about that. Give yourself chances to win, uh, and eventually it's going to work out in your favor. We've seen. Uh, you know, speaking of heritage, uh, and one thing I'm always impressed with you is how well you remember everything. Um, I'm already forgetting the RBC heritage, uh, but like Shane Lowry putting that chip shot in the water, um, like without that, you know, things could go a lot differently. And if you're not factoring in all that kind of stuff, if you're not watching every single shot of a, of a golf event, which is hard enough as it is, because it's not all televised, but you know, you can leave yourself open to a lot of biases. You can look at Patrick Cantlay and say, the amount of times he was in contention or Xander was in contention, John Rahm even in contention, but doesn't get the win. I think you're overall doing yourself a disservice. And as, whereas we have with Colin Morikawa winning at a high rate, that might not be sustainable. Um, how many times has he been maybe in contention, but didn't, didn't pop, uh, didn't close it out, um, didn't chase down the leader. And we're forgetting about that. So a lot of things can stick with us. Uh, it's, you know, and that's one thing that I struggle with when I watch golf is we're looking at these such these outcome driven results that if someone makes a putt or doesn't make a putt hits a green or has one spin off, it's like that sticks with you. And it probably shouldn't because we we're looking at, we need to be looking at a, a larger sample here um, to point us in the right direction and weed out some of this variance that can stick and, and result in wins and losses. 
to circle this back to putting before we get out of here, there are certain types of players, and I think this term has gotten overblown a little bit, but I do think about guys who have spike putting weeks. And Morikawa is one of those guys. And you can kind of tell from Thursday on when it's going to happen because he's such a bad putter when he doesn't have it. He just misses everything. But if you just start seeing him make a few of these like eight foot putts in a tournament, you're like, oh, I think that's why he ends up closing a lot more than a lot of people because his ball striking is always so consistent that his results are going to look fine either way, whether he loses two strokes putting, breaks even with the field, even loses four strokes putting. Like to take the heritage as an example, the guy dropped almost six strokes between chipping and putting and came in 26 because he was almost first in ball striking. Like, that's going to make up for everything. If all of a sudden, like, it's one of these weeks where he gains three or four strokes putting, he's going to have to do that over the course, basically, of the four rounds. You can't have a negative three in there on a Thursday and hope to gain four strokes during a tournament. That just doesn't happen. So it feels like you can tell with him right away. And then if he does have it, there's something about those greens. There's something about the confidence that week, something about the particular undulations in the green that we just can't quantify that he is figured out I think that that's why he closes more often than not and the longer term players that you're talking about be it Cantlay be it Xander those types of players they're just good across the board every single week that they never have these huge outliers with one thing and when you look at someone like Morikawa and Justin Thomas is another perfect example of this another guy who's kind of sucks at putting overall but then you look like man he gained seven strokes this week of course he won that not only can he go off with the putter and gain three to six during the course of a week you just know that he's probably going to lap the field in irons if he's going to win that week too because he's so good at that yeah absolutely um it's a it's something that that i'm trying to factor in a little bit more um in terms of my modeling with just sort of standard deviations and and variance uh when it comes to overall scoring but also putting um the funny thing though is we're talking about these guys uh morikawa can't lay (laughs) Uh, JT Xander, the 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 shared trait there, is that phenomenal awesome? tee to green play, and, and they're yeah, all awesome. phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal tee to green play. Uh, putting like the putting comes and goes, and this is just you know for anyone who's really digging into to golf, like we're not talking about Danny McCarthy and and you know Brendan Todd, and it's like if the tee to green game clicks, like watch out because their putter is going to be hot, like doesn't work that way. It's always the opposite. And so you're really splitting hairs with these, you know, top of the, like top of the, the rankings guys, top of the odd sports guys. I mean, yes, Morikawa does have those uh, spike weeks as we like to say. Um, And I tried to quantify some of that stuff. It's really hard to predict who's going to actually have it in a given week. But that's why if you just look at the ball striking you're going to be off to a good start almost always, especially when it comes to Morikawa. So I'm trying to figure out ways that we can figure uh, my model where it likes calling Morikawa a little bit more and gives him a little bit uh, uh, leeway whenever he doesn't bring the putter with him. It doesn't penalize him so much because when it's on, um, it's something special to watch. Well, it would be a really interesting article to figure out. So now that you've dug into putting a little bit, trying to figure out what the most predictive stats are going to be is, and you were talking about this before the show with me about you running your simulations and trying to find positive expected value bets in golf. And frankly, they just don't exist in the outright market, most definitely, because whatever the win percentage of a player is going to be, very rarely is going to translate into what their odds are ever going to be. It just doesn't happen. But could you write like some sort of, or try to figure out like the data centric argument between who is a better DFS play versus who's a better outright bet? Because sometimes I talk about that. Someone like Siwoo Kim, for example, although he has become more consistent uh, over the Mm -hmm. past 12 months for years, like he could just kind of show up and win out of nowhere for reasons, but he might also come in dead last. Now he's sort of an outlier. I think the example would probably be is Luke list versus Denny McCarthy is one, a better DFS play is one, a better outright win play, or is the answer just Luke list. So with DFS, uh, I know what you're getting at. It's that consistency, but in DFS, you still want upside. You still want all of your golfers to have a chance to win. And so in that case, it's almost always going to be Luke list for me. But one thing you can do um, if you're really curious, and I do have uh, these numbers not pulled up, but um, you can look at round round around uh, scoring variation. Um, And one of the, one or two of the names that really pops up is the most consistent golfers in terms of round around adjusted strokes gained. Victor Hovland, Daniel Berger, these guys are very, very consistent. But one thing that they have 
not a whole lot of wins, right? It's because they're always really good, but don't, don't necessarily have the variance required to best a field of 156 golfers in a given week. They're going to do it eventually. They're going to get there just because of how things unfold. It's not to say that they're not able to win a PGA Tour event. We know that that's not the case. It's more that they're very consistent. So you can look at standard deviation of round to round scoring. You can look at standard deviation of strokes gain to green, that kind of stuff. It is something that I have on the, on the back burner um, that I can try to look into a little bit more, but yes, um, variance is a big part of golf and you would rather have for an outright bet, someone who's going to either win or miss. It doesn't matter if he misses the cut for DFS, you still want that win upside because it's really hard to predict. Even if you have six golfers uh, that you're, that you have in your lineup, it's hard to pick the winner out of six, right? I know that there are salary constraints with that, but it's hard to pick the winner. And that's why you really want to have six golfers who can win a PGA tour event. For me, Danny McCarthy doesn't often fit that. And so I don't really play Danny McCarthy a lot in DFS, but Luke List, someone who has that top five, top one upside, um, if the putter doesn't completely abandon him. So in that, in that instance, like I know what you're, I know what you're getting at. I know what uh, historically I've considered to be, I want that consistency. I want the guy who's going to make the cut. You actually need a lot more than that um, when it comes to, to DFS. So for me, it comes down to the variance available within a golfer subset. And honestly, it's not as sticky as we'd like to think it is um, aside from like Daniel Berger, who seems to be um, just extremely consistent always. Uh, last two things. How do we come to terms with that? There's just a lot of events, especially very good field events that don't have strokes gain data. <laughs> so what you can look at there is um, we can always figure out strokes gain total. Um, it's just your score based on the field average for that day. Um, and you can adjust it for field strength if you want to try to factor that in a little bit. But um, that is another reason why you want to factor in long samples so that you're not looking at golfers who play, you know, f- two of their past, you know, four events um, in that 16 round sample or whatever that would be where that you don't have strokes gain data. Um, and so that is definitely a, a, a drawback of some of these events that don't have strokes gain data. It can also just be, you know, those, those alternate field events without strokes gain data. So for me, that's why I actually use just total strokes gained over the past year with all the adjustments that I use rather than uh, trying to use the granular strokes gain stats. When I model stuff out off the tee approach play around the green putting, I've tried that. It's not as good, honestly, for me, because I have those gaps. So I would say you can still use the, to- the total strokes gain data um, whenever we don't have the more granular stuff. I've also tried to convert things like distance and fairways hit, progress that into strokes gained off the tee, but um, distance alone explains about 22% of strokes gained off the tee. Fairways gained are basically pointless when it comes <laughs> to strokes gained off the tee. So it's really difficult. So for me, what I would say to that is be open to just using the total strokes gain numbers there. And again, as always, I know I, I keep saying this, but in golf, longer term samples have tested a lot better than shorter term samples. So just be open to the more boring approach of like 50, 75, 100 rounds than trying to chase the golfers who are really popping over the past, you know, 12 or, or 24 rounds. Well, let's try to end with this and try to build a pantheon of projectable sports data, which is the most accurate, which is the least accurate. And that's not to say the least accurate wouldn't have any predictive value, but I think that golf would probably be near the bottom of that list. I would guess basketball and baseball would probably be the top two because you have your constants and especially like after, you know, in an NBA lineup, who's actually playing and who's not playing. And then you can project out minutes. You can project out your perimeter defense, three, three point percentage, all of that stuff. And in baseball, you can kind of dig in even deeper once you know when the lineups come out. So would you agree that those two would be the most predictable or would there be another sport that you would throw in there? Um, I would actually put, I'm not the biggest baseball guy, but I, I've, I've dabbled over the years. I would put basketball number one in terms of predictability because we're looking at 100 plus possessions from every game. That stuff adds up quickly. Um, one example I, I always think of when I'm trying to explain something, uh, regression or variance is if I'm playing Steph Curry one on one, I'd rather play him to one than I would to 100 because he's going to demolish me either way, but I'd rather take my chances to beat him to one point 
um, than do a hundred. So for me, basketball is number one baseball definitely because and it depends on the stats you look at if you look at things like called strikes uh, plus whiff rate you're looking at pitch after pitch after pitch that stuff the sample grows quickly that stabilizes the stabilization rate um, pretty small there in terms of uh, those numbers but things like home run to fly ball rate don't really stabilize that's very fluky um kenyatta Storin's done some research on that uh, at numberfire.com for us and a lot of stats that you might want to look at with baseball still pretty fluky, but there are ways around that. So baseball, basketball, definitely way more predictive, uh, predictable than golf, even football, a lot more predictable than we think. Still a lot of variance in terms of touchdown expectations or touchdown outcomes, really. Uh, but yeah, golf is generally really hard to predict for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's that individual sport. One, you know, a, a putt or two doesn't fall. One bad shot into the trees you know, you're, and then you triple, you know, one of your holes in the first round, really hard to come back from that, even if you're a great player. So golf definitely toward the bottom. And the way that we can use that to our advantage still is fade, be open to fading the chalk in DFS. Um, I've done research on this, the betting favorite, the highest salary golfer um, in DFS, almost always the chalk, be open to fading the chalk a lot more um, than you probably do already, because that's what the data says to do. Uh, but also when it comes to betting, be open to fading some guys or just, you know, fading, but also really just not betting necessarily. Uh, the golfers who are performing really, really hot over a small sample, maybe really putting over expectation and consider the, the guys like a Patrick Cantlay um, a little bit more often who have really good long-term numbers, but just aren't getting as much love that week because the finishing positions maybe haven't been there. So variance can be really scary. It, can, it, it has like a negative connotation when it comes to sports betting, daily fantasy, but variance is really helpful if you know how to harness it. And honestly, it's just saying uh, maybe everyone has it a little bit more wrong and I'm okay deviating a little bit without being, you know, without being stupid. Right. I think that makes a lot of sense. Do you know what you don't know? And can you just realize that that's out there and you have to figure out a way to embrace that a little bit beyond golf, like at the bottom of projectable sports, I'm just trying to think like NASCAR must be impossible just based on crashes and you never know who's going to get taken out. MMA, I would guess is probably pretty tough as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just to, to rep number fire here, um, Jim Sonis does a fantastic work with NASCAR modeling. He's actually pretty consistent. I know that he, he does a good job. Um, factoring in crash probabilities. Um, Austin Swaim does a pretty good job or does a great job at projecting out MMA stuff, UFC stuff, but it's pretty difficult to uh, project because one punch can end a fight. Um, so if you're, if you're getting five guaranteed rounds, it's a little more predictive, but when it comes to like heavyweights, light heavyweights and, you know, it can end in, in eight seconds. Yeah. That's a lot harder to predict. So, I would think that golf, at least with two guaranteed rounds, barring a withdrawal, um, a little bit more predictable than something like UFC, but still pretty hard uh, to predict long term or not long term, but you know, short term um, in a given week. And that's why, again, I think the way you put it uh, makes a lot of sense. Be OK knowing what you don't know and use that to your advantage rather than thinking that it's a uh, negative because everyone's dealing with the same thing. Yeah, there's just no way. I mean, look at my results. There's no way you can know everything. In fact, it's kind of difficult to know 10% of things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I look, I look, I said, I, I built out a model. I look at all this stuff. My head to head betting in golf is awful. Um, I have a lot more success with the more volatile, high variance outrights uh, than I do with head to head because what I think makes the most sense targeting the better tee to green golfer in a given matchup. That's not enough uh, to to get me where I'm going with head to heads. It's It's a struggle of mine and um, I think that I implement the variance of outright markets a lot better than I do. We're trying to predict something that's ultimately very hard to predict, um, which of the two, you know, equal level golfers is going to have the better week. That's a lot harder for me than just trying to, um, embrace the volatility of who might, who has the, the best odds to outperform everyone else in a given week. Check out the heat check podcast wherever you download podcasts leave a rating and review as well brandon and jim are two of my favorite people in the industry to consume their content to read what they're saying because like i said we cover very similar topics in very different ways <laughs> 
I appreciate that. Yeah, I love I love listening to your show. I learn a lot. Um, I, I I always learn um, who you know bogeyed uh, the 18th to, to miss a cut uh, from three years ago. Whereas, like I said, I forget what already what happened last week when it comes to golf. So I always love uh, whenever you go back into the into the history books um, and have some uh, some some color to to give on on past uh, golf events. Well, when you're able to look at numbers and results and project things out forward, I just have a good memory. I can't do any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, my memory's terrible. Uh, stuff just goes goes out the window as soon as it's done. Um, and that's why I think I, I need the data uh, to, to, to rely on here so that I can kind of remember who's a good golfer and who isn't. Uh, you can find Brandon on Twitter at Gadula, G-D-U-L-A 13 on Twitter and check out all of his work at Number Fire, especially if you're looking for the article that he wrote about the putting variants. If anything is sticky, you can really, you can glean a lot more from reading the article, seeing the table, seeing the numbers than us just kind of wrapping back and forth. But I was really happy with how this turned out because there's very few people that I feel like we can go back and forth, have a semi-listenable conversation for people about strokes gain metrics and projectable golf data. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I know the, it's hard to, like, as you said, it's hard to sit back and listen to this and really find a way to implement it, but there are ways to do it um, and build out that mixed condition model on fantasy national. Um, and you'll, and you'll have, uh, you should have some good success there. Well, fantasynational.com slash mayo will get you 20% off. Don't forget about that. You can hit it down in the description as well. Sub to the newsletter, smash the like, sub to the podcast, rate and review and all that fun stuff. Thank you all for watching. I'm Pat Mayo. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.